Hi, Hamza. So uh, welcome to the second scenario. Are you ready to start? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so the first question is, can you see the, can you see my screen? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I can. Yep. Right. First question is, how do vaccines work? So, uh, I'm not quite, I'm not quite certain about this, but so I know that the goal of a vaccine is to provide like long-term immunity against a pathogen uh, without having developed those signs and symptoms originally. And I know that like, some vaccines kind of they inject like a a dead or attenuated form of the pathogen and that like that will do something but i'm not exactly certain like how it gets from like the kind of injection to the long-term immunity so here we have a candidate who doesn't exactly know uh, the process or the answer behind the question but what's important is that they focus on the parts that they do know for example, they take the examiner through their thinking, and that's really key. Most people fail the Oxbridge interviews because they simply sit there in silence. What you need to be doing is speaking out loud, engaging with the interviewer, and in fact, most of the time, the Oxbridge tutors will throw out a little bit of information that might act as an important clue. Now, if you're sat there panicking and trying to think through your own logic, you're going to miss those clues. So it's really important for you to be receptive and try and think about why the examiner in front of you is trying to prompt you in a particular direction because they're trying to help. They want you to succeed because at the end of the day, they want an interesting conversation. It's boring to watch 30 candidates sort of fail and sit there and panic. They want to have a conversation with you. So just bear that in mind. Now, the weaker part of this answer is that it sort of peters out very quickly. We say something like inject, injecting will do something. It's all a bit vague. If you're going to say something, try and say it technically correct. Don't just say an injection will do something and then uh, move on from that. You really need to define what you're talking about because otherwise you come across not as confident. Is there any type of um, cell that you think helps, um, helps with the immune response? Um once you once you've been given the vaccine so i guess if we're just like thinking about normal kind of immunity when you're exposed to an antigen maybe antigen presenting cells uh that might like so like macrophages that might come along and like do phagocytosis which uh makes them into antigen presenting cells and then maybe from there maybe you have activation of t cells potentially and then they'll activate B cells, uh, which will produce maybe memory, uh, memory cells, but... So here the candidate shows a good sequence of events. We talk about antigen presenting cells. We then go on to talk about T cells. But the biggest thing that I want to get across from this part of the interview is the confidence level. We're simply not confident here. The candidate doubts themselves. They finish every sentence on a high like this. Is it is it this answer? I'm not quite sure. It, then the B cells go like this. like. Talking like that just implies that you don't know what you're saying. At the same time, the candidate asks at the end, am I on the right tracks? Now, the interviewer will automatically jump in and try and guide you towards the right tracks. So there's really no point to ask whether you're doing the right thing or may, am I answering the question correctly? They're simply not going to tell you. They'll just point you in the direction that they want you to go in. So all in all, this is a good answer, but it was slightly hampered by the fact that the candidate shows a lack of confidence in their own abilities. And I think that's really clear in this section and something to avoid. Can you name any types of vaccine? So I think, yeah, I think you've got the dead, like uh, dead pathogen vaccine. It's like an inactivated vaccine. Um, I think, I guess you'll have also like it'll be an live but it'll be attenuated so it'll be seriously weakened that it won't cause severe symptoms um and i think that would be something like you know i think like uh maybe the covid vaccine might be a live or attenuated form um and then yeah i think those would be the main ones i'm aware of so here we have a question about the different types of vaccine and this candidate gives a good answer, focusing on the live attenuated virus vaccines, as well as the dead vaccines. Now, what they're missing is the polysaccharide vaccines, which focus on a little part of the antigen and inject that, as well as the newer techniques like that's been discovered through COVID. So injecting RNA vaccines. 
and using viral vectors in order to transduce cells. Now, all of that is clearly new information which was missed out by this candidate. However, they also do a good job of explaining what they do know. So they talk about that live attenuated vaccine and they talk about COVID being an example of that. Now, giving those extra little examples show that you're thinking a bit more about the modern world around you and that you're interested and passionate about your subject, which is literally your number one task in these interviews. So all in all, although this candidate doesn't give a comprehensive answer about every type of vaccine, they do show good knowledge on the ones that they do talk about. What are the risks that you know of live vaccines? So I guess like any, any drug or any treatment, you could have severe allergic reactions to it. Um, where the, and yeah, also if there is like a vaccine that isn't properly attenuated, it could cause the disease then, which would be a problem, especially for serious infection. Um, there could also be that virus could like mutate and become worse or more deadly form of it. And then that could then cause further issues. Here the candidate talks about allergic reactions to start, and that's really important because it's thinking a bit out of the box. Not everyone will mention that, but it's really important to what we do as doctors because any medication that we give, any treatment, we're going to be on the lookout for those allergic reactions because it could happen with anything. So that's a really good clinically relevant answer that not everyone would think of. Second, we talk about the virus reverting to virulence and essentially the vaccine causing the disease that it was meant to prevent. And finally, we talk about the virus mutating and therefore rendering the vaccine inactive or potentially even worse. Now, my issue with this last part of the question is it comes across very vague. The candidate says that the virus can mutate, blah, 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 and cause some issues. Now, just saying some issues is fine, but I would expect the candidate to elaborate a little bit more about what those issues are. And that's what's a bit vague about this answer. So all in all, it's a solid answer. It covers a lot of ground, but it sort of finishes on a weaker note by petering out again and seeming a bit less confident towards the end. Why are live vaccines more effective? Um, is it because they, they are like constantly triggering that immune response? Like it, it because there's, there's a more effective an efficient immune response that's been triggered uh, from it. So maybe that would be helpful to developing longer immunity, but I'm not exactly sure again how that happens. So here the candidate is again questioning themselves and again, it comes across not exactly confident. Now, what I would expect here is for the candidate to say it's more immunogenic. And essentially the principle is because you've got both B cell involvement as well as T cell involvement. So aside from the technical difficulties here and the confidence issues, the candidate gives a good attempt, but really we need that precise terminology. This is more immunogenic as a vaccine. What type of vaccines do you know are being used for COVID? So I've heard like there's a lot of like mRNA based vaccines, which are like the new kind of type. And I know that mRNA is the um, molecule that is used in transcription or made in transcription and it's used to guide translation in protein synthesis. So maybe what the mRNA vaccine is doing is it uh, helps to kind of uh, prevent that kind of, it, it maybe creates molecules that will prevent transcription of viral proteins. Uh, and do you know any other? Um, not really sure. No problem. Uh, okay. Here, the candidate feels a lot more confident. They start talking about mRNA vaccines and how they exactly work. And importantly, they use their knowledge of what they've learned in A-level biology about mRNA in order to try and elaborate on what this vaccine might be doing and essentially how it works. And that's really important. It brings in that passion. Hopefully you can see that it shows that the candidate is interesting, they're engaging, they're thinking about the question a bit more dynamically, and all of that is proper quality stuff. Now, what I would say about this question is that, again, they tend to start to feel like they're forgetting the question a little bit. The question was about different types of vaccines in the COVID period. And this candidate starts to go on a rant about what they know about mRNA and how that vaccine works, rather than exploring different types of vaccine, which they might have read about. 
Now, in this case, you could also talk about the vectors being used. For example, the adenovirus vector, the common cold virus vector, and how that's been used to package this mRNA in order to deliver it into cells. So all in all, there's a lot to talk about, and this candidate does a really good job at the first part, but again, slightly forgets the question towards the end. How would you design an ethical study to test how effective a vaccine was? So I guess like any good clinical study, it would have to be uh, double-blinded with a placebo control, and there would be randomization of the groups. Um, obviously, the problem that there might be with that is that um, there might be an ethical problem. If some people get the disease and get seriously ill, that would not be a good thing. Or the alternative is to do like with a lot of like, uh, I don't know what the term is, but they're like studies that kind of after the event has happened and you see like what percentage did it work or did it not work with the natural infection. So this is really good stuff. We talk about double blinding. We talk about controls. We talk about the need for randomization. All of that is proper quality science. Now, the weaker parts of this answer is essentially the vagueness to it again. We start talking about studies after the event, which is quite vague. As well, we don't really have a structure through which we're going through. Now, my advice to you as a candidate, if you get asked this question, is to start talking about the PICO structure. What that essentially means is P-I-C-O, standing for population. What population are you studying? Is it relevant? Is it representative? What interventions are you taking? Is that the gold standard? Is there reason to take these interventions? What control are we using? Is it placebo or is it the gold standard in the literature? And what outcomes are being studied? Are they primary outcomes like end mortality, end morbidity, or are they more surrogate outcomes? For example, length of stay in A&E, which isn't really relevant to the patient, but may in be inferred to be relevant through the patient through something else. Now, using that kind of structure will show you that you really know your stuff. After that, you can start talking about a bit more about methodology. So double blinding, about concealment, placebos, all of that stuff is really useful, as well as the statistics about whether these statistical tests are significant or not, and whether the study is adequately powered to detect that statistical significance in the first place. So all of those things are really relevant here. And this answer, although comprehensive, scratches the surface of things you could say and would benefit from a little bit more structure. Can you think of any viruses or other infectious disease that we don't have a vaccine for yet and suggest why this might be? So malaria, we don't have a vaccine for. Uh, I think, firstly, because it's a parasitic infection, the natural infection does not elicit a proper immune response. And also, maybe there's not just not enough funding for it at the moment. Um, HIV, which I think is quite difficult to do a vaccine for because it targets the immune cells themselves. So that then becomes like, it, it's almost like it's difficult because if you get a vaccine for it, it's targeting the immune cells that you're trying to make against it. And also there, there isn't a lot of antibody response to it. So I think those might be kind of the key ones. This is a nice finish to this interview. The candidate shows good knowledge of malaria and HIV, as well as some discussion about why those might not have vaccines associated with them. In the malaria case, we talk about funding and the economical implications of that disease. And in the HIV example, we're talking about the biology behind the disease and why it might be difficult to design a vaccine which is targeting immune cells themselves. So all in all, this is a really strong end to the interview.